a very good evening aspirants we are very happy to bring to your attention that shankar ais academy is launching two initiatives for the benefit of aspirants in the mains examination you all are aware about the mains booster 2023 under which you will be provided 40 mains oriented tests in 90 days the booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your mains score it starts on october 31st and will include sectional tests half papers and civil service examination emulators it is available in both online and offline modes for just 4500 rupees and on top of that we are launching a new initiative called sa augmenta 2023 under this initiative you will be provided with four tests to enhance your essays it is also available in both online and offline modes you will get a different approach towards essay writing along with pre essay and post essay discussions To further enhance the content of essays you will be provided with the summarized essay material combined with mentorship all these offer just 6000 rupees so grab these chances to kick start your mains exam preparation and to improve your main score and with this note let us get into the daily hindu news analysis for the date 20th october 2022 Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this text and context article. It reports that China has placed a hold on a joint India-US proposal. See, the proposal is to designate Lashkar-e-Taiba Commander Shahid Mahmood under United Nations Security Council's one two six seven list of terrorists. See this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we'll learn what is the resolution 1267, adoption of other resolutions relating to 1267, and finally we'll also see about the reasons given by China for placing a hold on the adoption procedure of terrorists proposed by India. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. And with this, let's start our discussion. Firstly we'll see briefly about the mandate of UNSC. See the core mandate of the Security Council contained in Article 24 Clause 1 of the UN Charter is to take primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. So this is the core mandate of UN Charter and that is exactly why UNSC's permanent member countries are provided with veto power and other countries like India don't have See this is the basis of the resolution 1267. Now let us see what is resolution 1267 of 1999. See the resolution 1267 of the United Nations Security Council deals with the issue of terrorism. Its main objective is to stop terrorist activities by issuing sanctions against them. See sanctions here means a threatened penalty for disobeying a rule or law. See the resolution 1267 was introduced in the year 1999 and subsequent changes were made in the years 2011 and 2015 See with the adoption of 2011 resolution the security council decided that the list of individuals and entities would be split into two and one of them looked after the al qaeda and the other looked after the taliban And again after the adoption of 2015 resolution the security council decided to expand the listing criteria to include the individuals and entities supporting the Islamic state in Iraq and Levant which is shortly referred as ISIL Now this is about the basics of the resolution 1267 Now coming to what is discussed in the article the resolution of 1267 allows any UN member state to propose adding the name of a terrorist or a terror group to a consolidated list and this list is maintained by 1267 committee that has affiliations to al qaeda and ISIL See the article says that China has placed a hold on a joint US Indo resolution This resolution is to designate the Lashkar-e-Taiba commander Shahid Mahmood as a terrorist affiliated to Al Qaeda and ISIS. See through placing a hold to the proposed name, China has used its veto power. And as a permanent member of the UNSC, China can do this any number of times. 
and this is what is discussed in the article see what is this article about the article is about the addition of a name of a terrorist in the consolidated list maintained by the 1267 committee now what is the criteria for the declaration of terrorist the criteria includes acts or activities indicating that individual or group or undertaking or any entity is associated with ISIL and al qaeda this means that they are first participating in the financing planning facilitating preparing or perpetrating of acts in the support of terrorism second they are supplying selling or transferring arms and related material to terrorism and third they are recruiting or otherwise supporting acts or activities of isil or al qaeda or any cell or derivative thereof so these are the criteria for which an individual a group an undertaking or entity is declared as terrorist and they are proposed to be added in the consolidated list now coming to the special committee which looks after the resolution 1267 See the committee comprises 15 members of the security council and it makes its decisions by consensus. Here 15 nations include permanent members which is 5 countries and non-permanent members which includes 10 countries who are elected from the member states of United Nations. See non-permanent members they are cyclically elected for a period of 2 years. Here know that Currently India is one of the 10 non permanent members to the UNSC. So what does this mean? This means that India is one of the members of the special committee which looks after the resolution 1267. But since it is a non permanent member, it does not have veto power like China. Now coming to the mandate of the committee, see the committee is mandated to oversee the implementation of the sanctions measures. and it is mandated to oversee the designated individuals and entities who meet the listing criteria set out in the relevant resolutions and thirdly it is mandated to consider and decide upon the notifications and requests for exemptions from the sanctions measures and fourthly it is mandated to consider and decide upon the request to remove a name from the ISIL al qaeda sanctions list fifthly it is mandated to conduct periodic and specialized reviews of the entries on isil and al qaeda sanctions list sixthly it is mandated to examine the reports presented by the monitoring team and after that it is mandated to report annually to the security council on the implementation of the sanctions measures and finally it is mandated to conduct the outreach activities now these are all the mandates of the 1267 resolution overlooking committee now coming to the effects of the sanction see the effects of the sanctions include three things one is asset freeze the other one is travel ban and the third one is arms embargo now let's see them one by one see first of all asset freeze is imposed see the purpose of the assets freeze is to deny the listed individuals groups undertakings and entities the means to support terrorism it is obvious right if we cut the finance then they can't support the terrorism to achieve this it seeks to ensure that no funds and financial assets or economic resources of any kind are available to any individual or any group of terrorism and this is done for so long as they remain subjected to the sanctions measures see this particular type of sanction is done to stop the economical support given to the terrorist activities now coming to the second one do you remember what is the second one exactly it is the travel ban see the purpose of the travel ban is to limit the mobility of the listed individuals see member states are encouraged to add the name of the listed individuals to their visa watch list and they are also encouraged to add the names of the listed individuals to their national watch list see this is done to ensure the effective implementation of travel ban see if they are watched then only we can limit their movement right and this is about the travel ban now thirdly there is this arms embargo and it is imposed on the sanctioned individual or the group see the obligation of member states to implement the arms embargo means that they have to prevent the direct or indirect supply sale 
or transfer of arms and related material to the sanctioned individual or group now apart from this technical advice assistance or training related to military activities are also prevented to the sanctioned individuals or groups now these are all the effects of sanctions on the designated terrorist now coming back to the article we saw that china has placed a hold on proposal to add shahid mahmood to the 1267 terrorist list right now what are all the reasons given by china for that china says that there is no conclusive evidence to prove the wrong doing of the accused and it also said that it needs time to study the issue before coming to a conclusion regarding including sahid mahmood in the terrorist list see the real reason for placing the hold might be to not affect the friendly relation that china maintains with pakistan why is pakistan coming here see pakistan is where sahid mahmood is based so to not offend pakistan china may have done that but what is china saying officially it is saying that there is no conclusive evidence now we can't do much here why is that because china has veto power in unsc but india it is a non permanent member so what are the ways in which india can raise the issue see india can raise the issue in the fatf meetings fatf is nothing but the financial action task force and it was established in the year 1989 by a group of seven summit that is g7 summit in paris See, it was established initially to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering. Then, subsequently, the mandate of FATF got expanded to incorporate efforts to combat terrorist financing in addition to money laundering. Now, other than FATF, India and US have built their own separate list of most wanted terrorists. See, they have done this to document the cases against the terrorist. with the view to eventually receiving a global cooperation on banning them and apart from this india can also raise the issue in shanghai cooperation organization csco has a separate anti terrorism structure called rats and this rats is expanded as the regional anti terrorist structure now these are some of the other ways in which india can raise the issue of terrorism in the international arena Now that's all about this news article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the resolution one two six seven of nineteen ninety nine, and adoption of other resolutions relating to it. And we saw the criteria for listing an individual or group in the one two six seven consolidated list of terrorists. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing why China has refused to place Shahid Mahmood in the list, and what other ways India has to address the issue of terrorism. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion Now have a look at this news article this news article talks about the vultures See it is a news because Tamil Nadu launches a mission to save the critically endangered vultures and why is this mission launched See India's vulture population is declining at an alarming rate of 96% and that too between 1993 and 2003 So the central government put into place two action plans to protect the species at the national level. The first one was in the year 2006 and the second one is an ongoing plan which is for 2020 2025. One of the important action points in this nationwide plan is the formulation of state level committees to save the critically endangered population of vultures. and following this action point only tamil nadu government formed a state level committee to set up an institutional framework for the effective conservation of vultures and note that in tamil nadu four species of vultures are found and those four species of vultures are given in this news article they include oriental white backed vulture long billed vulture red headed vulture and egyptian vulture Now the state level committee will take steps for monitoring the conservation and recovery of existing vulture sites. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context we are going to discuss about vultures in prelims perspective. See vultures are scavenging birds. Know that they have been divided into new world vultures and old world vultures. See new world vultures include the Californian condors and Andean condors 
and the old world vultures include the white rumped and red headed vultures now coming to its habitat new world vultures are found in the northern south america and old world vultures are found in europe africa and asia but according to government sources there are no vultures in australia and antarctica see these are important facts take note of it now with respect to india nine species of vultures exist in india they include oriental white backed vulture slender billed vulture long billed vulture egyptian vulture red headed vulture indian griffon vulture himalayan griffon vulture cinereus vulture and bearded vulture see among them five belong to the genus gyps and in these five species three of them namely the white rumped vulture long billed vulture and the slender billed vulture they are the residents of india and the remaining two that is the eurasian griffon vulture and himalayan griffon vulture they are largely wintering species see so far we saw the basics about vulture their characteristics and habitat now we are going to talk about the significance of it See they play a vital role in the ecosystem by cleaning up the rotten carcasses left in the open environment. So how do they clean the carcasses? See they scavenge on carcasses of animals and thereby helping to keep the environment clean. See here carcasses means the dead flesh of the animals. Now apart from this they also scavenge on human carcasses. See here I'll tell you about the religious practice of the Parsi community regarding the disposal of dead bodies. See what they do is they follow the practice of sky burial where the corpse is exposed to the rays of the sun and the corpse or the dead body is consumed or devoured by birds of prey such as vultures and crows. See why do the Parsi community follow this kind of disposal of dead bodies? See they follow the sky burials in order to cleanly and efficiently dispose the human bodies. So these are all the significance of the vultures. Now we saw that the vulture population is declining. So what does this mean? This means that the removal of a major scavenger from the ecosystem will affect the equilibrium of the ecosystem. That is the removal of the vultures from the ecosystem will result in building up of decaying carcasses now having said that what causes the declining population of vultures or in other words what are the threats that are faced by the vultures firstly there is this poisoning from diclofenac see this diclofenac is used as veterinary non steroidal anti inflammatory drug it is shortly referred as nsaid and it is used for livestock See this drug treats the pain and the inflammatory diseases such as gout in the livestock and these livestock when they are dead they become the carcasses for vultures to feed on and the drug which is present in the dead carcasses of the animals affects the vulture and it leads to the death of vultures see you won't believe this just 0.4 to 0.7 percentage of animal carcasses contaminated with diclofenac is sufficient to decimate 99 percentage of the vulture populations so because of this only the ministry of environment and forest released the action plan for vulture conservation in the year 2006 and this included the ban of veterinary use of diclofenac by the drugs controller general of india now this is one threat And secondly there is this loss of natural habitats. And how is this happening? This is due to anthropogenic activities that includes the developmental process and the infrastructure establishments. Now this is one threat. And the final one is the electrocution by power lines. See these are the main reasons why the vulture population is declining. Now having seen the threats now let us see the conservation efforts. See the action plan for vulture conservation 2020 to 2025 was launched by Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change. And what are all the objectives of this action plan? The first objective is the drug control. Drug control in the sense it ensures the minimum use of diclofenac. 
And the second objective is to carry out safety testing of available NSAIDs on vultures and to develop new ones which do not affect the vultures. And the third objective is to ensure that Drug Controller General of India must institute a system that automatically removes the drug from veterinary use if it is found to be toxic to vultures. See, such a system would ensure that drugs other than diclofenac that are toxic to vultures like acyclofenac and keptoprofen are banned for the veterinary use. And the next objective is to focus on upscaling the conservation. See, this is done to establish additional conservation breeding centers along with the vulture conservation centers. And the next objective is to implement the Vulture Safe Zone program at 8 different places in the country where there are existing populations of vultures. And the next one is to launch conservation plans for the red-headed and the Egyptian vultures with breeding programs for both. And then the last objective is to build 4 rescue centers for different geographical areas like Pinjor in the north, Bhopal in central India, Gawati in Northeast and Hyderabad in South India. See, this is regarding the Action Plan for Vulture Conservation 2020-2025. And then the next conservation effort is SAVE program. See, it is abbreviated as Saving Asia's Vulture from Extension. See, it is the consortium of like-minded regional and international organizations. It is created to oversee and coordinate conservation, campaigning, and fundraising activities to help the plight of South Asia's vultures. Now coming to the objective of the program, it is to save the three critically important species from extinction through a single program. They are given in this image here. What are they? They are red-headed vulture, slender-billed and white rumped vulture. Know that the save partners are Bombay Natural History Society, Bird Conservation Nepal, RSPB UK, National Trust for Nature Conservation, Nepal, International Centre for Birds of Prey, UK and Zoological Society of London. Now that's all regarding this news article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about vultures, their habitat, significance, threats faced by them and some of the conservation efforts taken by the government. With these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. See this editorial article here, it speaks about how climate change has affected the people and it also talks about the life, which is a perspective announced by our Prime Minister at the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 last year. And then the article also mentions about the India's effort in mitigating climate change and finally about the needed responsibility of the developed countries in climate change mitigation. So in this discussion, we are going to see all of these points. See, these points are very important because they will definitely help you to write your mains answer in a better way. Now before getting into the discussion, go through the syllabus given here. It is relevant to the topic that we have taken for discussion. See, how is the world today? Today, the world is facing multiple crises. It seems like the world is in conflict mode all the time. Now only we are recovering from COVID pandemic. Immediately, the war between Russia and Ukraine started. And as a consequence of the war, the food inflation is spiraling and the cost of living is also becoming high across the world. So to answer my question, how is the world today? It is facing multiple crises at a time. And due to this situation, measures for human development has declined over the time. It is also evident from the recent UNDP's Human Development Report. See, the report has warned that the global human development measures has declined across most of the countries in the past two years. And the report also cites reasons for this decline. And what are those reasons? The report says that the decline is due to the triple planetary crisis which includes climate change, pollution and biodiversity loss. Now you may ask a question. If we have climate change problem, pollution problem and biodiversity loss problem, then we can address that also and then we can invest in human development measures also, right? Yeah, we can address the climate change problem on one hand and we can also invest in human development measures on the other hand. But the problem here is that the intensity of these problems are very high. Now, how am I saying this? 
See, as per the article, nine of the warmest years on record have come in the past decade alone. So, out of the ten years, nine were the warmest years. And in this year also, that is in the year 2022, we have faced record-breaking heat waves, floods, droughts, and other extreme forms of weather. And all these conditions have forced us to face devastating impacts. So this extreme intensity of the problem, that is the climate change problem, has led to the decline in the human development measures. And what can be done to address these problems? See the Paris Agreement and the COP26 summit of the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow represented this problem. And as an outcome of the summit, the countries are taking collective steps to limit greenhouse gas emissions. See, this is a positive step. Yeah, I agree. But then also, the commitments will not keep the warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. See, this 1.5 degrees Celsius is only the target that gives us the best chance to reduce the climate change impacts. But what are the experts saying? They are saying that the commitments will not keep the global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what is the reason for it? See, we have set a target. We are working towards the attainment of the target. But what is making the gap increase between our efforts and the target? See, it is the individual consumption. We all know that the governments and the industries that emit greenhouse gases are carrying the biggest responsibility for responding to the crisis. But at the same time, we as people are playing a very large role in driving the unsustainable production methods. And these unsustainable production methods are only the cause of the crisis. Now you may ask a question, why is unsustainable production methods are existing in the first place? See, the main culprit here is the individual consumption rate. If a person is consuming a lot and he is demanding a lot, and obviously the industries will produce more, right? And this leads to unsustainable production methods. And this in turn causes devastating impacts in the form of climate change, pollution, global warming, etc. And keeping in mind the importance of an individual contribution to the crisis, our Prime Minister has announced a much needed perspective, the life. See, life is expanded as lifestyle for environment. See, it is as simple as that. How our lifestyle should be which suits the environment. And this perspective is announced at the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in November 2021. See, the fascinating fact about the perspective, that is the life, is that it recognizes small individual actions like saving energy at home, cycling and using public transport instead of driving your own vehicle, eating more plant-based foods and reduce the wastage of foods and leveraging our position as consumers and employees to demand climate-friendly choices. Why life is recognizing all these small, small actions? See, these small, small actions only will help in addressing the larger climate change impacts. See, have you heard about this? Many of the goals are achieved by deploying small, small nudges. Here, nudges is nothing but a gentle persuasion technique to encourage positive behavior among people. And the perspective which was launched by our Prime Minister is also based on this only. See, in this line, UNEP also encourages employing proven nudging techniques such as discouraging food waste by offering small plates and cafeterias, encouraging recycling by making bin lids eye-catching, and encouraging cycling by creating cycle paths. From this itself, you can see how the nudging technique, that is the persuasion technique, helps in reinforcing positive behavior among the people. Now, according to UNEP data, more than two-thirds of greenhouse gas emissions are because of household consumption and lifestyles. And because of this only, UNEP is advocating for widespread adoption of greener consumption habits. So, in the global arena, life is seen as a global vision to encourage individual actions. And in this lines, yesterday, our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi and the UN Secretary General, Antonio, they both called on the customers across the world to become 
pro planet people and they said that this should be done by the year 2027 and how it can be done it can be done by adopting simple lifestyle changes that can collectively lead to transformational change see pro planet people it is very simple right we have to become planet people which supports the environment let it grow and we have to sustainably benefit from it now you may think many initiatives are like this regarding climate change pollution etc right but will it perform well on ground level don't worry it will definitely perform well see india has a proven record of individual actions the apt example is the success of swachh bharat mission we all know what is swachh bharat mission right it mobilized the individuals and communities to become the drivers of collective good health and sanitation if we can see the success of swachh bharat mission we can also see the success of life see so far we saw that life is about individual actions transforming lifestyle and becoming pro planet people etc right but at the same time life also advocates for the support of developed countries in climate adaptation and mitigation for the most affected countries why life is asking the support of developed countries see as we all know the data shows that the average carbon footprint of a person in a high income country is more than 80 times higher than that of a person in a least developed country and for this reason only life is asking for the support of developed countries it is only fair right if they are polluting the world then they should take part in the mitigation measures also now here remember the words of mahatma gandhi see the world has enough for everyone's need but not enough for everyone's greed now that's all for this article discussion now like life do you know any other efforts that are taken by india to address climate change see we have seen many efforts taken by indian government to address climate change in our analysis they include panchamrit targets announced by again our prime minister at cop26 there is this international solar alliance coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure and south south cooperation platforms like this many more are there so i have a task for you go and search for the initiatives taken by indian government in the global arena to address the climate change and post your answer in the comment section now that's all about this article discussion in this discussion we saw about the current scenario of the world and the crisis faced by the world and the reasons for it and we saw about a new perspective which is life and we also saw about the pro planet people and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the initiatives taken by indian government to address the climate change now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this news article see it talks about the new credit framework which is a part of national educational policy see this article reports that the draft of new credit framework has been released for the process of public consultations and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context we'll see about new credit framework of national education policy firstly we'll see about what is new credit framework see ncrf is an umbrella framework used for the evaluation of skilling reskilling upskilling accreditation in educational and skilling institutions so this is nothing but an evaluation process now what are the objectives of this framework see the objectives are to seamlessly integrate the credits earned through school education higher education and vocational and skill education then to support educational acceleration for students with gifted learning abilities and the other objective is to recognize the skills that are informally obtained through the traditional family inheritance work experience or other methods and finally its objective is to integrate the academic and vocational domains to ensure flexibility and mobility between the two here note that the national credit framework is going to be based on three already existing qualification frameworks so what are the three already existing qualification frameworks they include national higher education qualification framework national skills qualification framework national school education qualification framework so these are some basics about the national credit framework 
Now, what is the benefit of having this framework? See, the benefit of national credit framework is multifold. See, the credit framework will enable broad-based, multidisciplinary, holistic education with flexible curriculum, creative combinations of subjects. And this is one benefit. See, if NCRF is rightly implemented, it will lead to lifelong learning through multiple entry and exit options. And this benefit is for the students. Now, coming to the benefit for the government, this framework will lead to highly educated, trained workforce for Atma Nirbar Bharat. Now, what is the benefit for the industry? See, for the industry, reskilling and upskilling of its employees will be made easy. And finally, for the institutions, credit calculation mechanism will be made more easier. And uniformity across institutions will be ensured by this new credit framework. Now, these are some of the benefits of the National Credit Framework. See, while answering the question, your answer should also be like this. You have to cover multiple perceptions. Here, I have covered the benefits for students, institutions, industries, government. Like this, if you cover multiple perspectives, then it will be easy for you to get more marks in your mains answer. Now, adding to this, know that implementation of this new framework is going to be done through a Academic Bank of Credit, ABC, which could digitally store the academic credits earned from recognized institutions so that the degrees can be awarded taking into account the credits earned. So, that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the new credit framework, its objectives, its benefits, and we also saw about the Academic Bank of Credit. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the mission Deaf Space. See, it was launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the ongoing Defence Expo. Now, adding to this, he also released the fourth defence indigenization list, which bars the import of 101 items after certain timelines. So, what does this mean? This means that the items on the list cannot be imported by the services and should be sourced from within the country. See, this is done to boost the domestic defense industry and promote the defense exports. And the article also says that during this expo, it is affirmed that India is sharing its space science with more than 60 developing countries. One of the greatest examples for this is South Asia Satellite. And then, the Prime Minister, during this Defence Expo, unveiled the HTT-40 Indigenous Trainer Aircraft. So, it was designed and developed by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. And for the procurement of these trainers, the Cabinet Committee on Security is expected to give its final approval. See, all these points together encompasses the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about this different space mission and the South Asia satellite briefly. First of all, let us take this defense space mission. See, this deaf space mission was launched for the purpose of developing innovative solutions for the armed forces. So, why do we need innovative solutions? See, the three armed services, they have identified various challenges in space security and technology. And it has to be solved soon. And this is the purpose behind launching this mission. So, in this line, the mission aims to develop innovative solutions for defense forces to address the space security and technology. And this is done through industry and startups. And importantly, the initiative will prepare India for the future possibilities in space domain and will also increase the country's preparation further. See, as we saw in the news article, there are so many countries with whom India is sharing its space science. And by next year, 10 ASEAN countries will also get their real-time access to India's satellite data. And not only this, even developed countries like Europe and America, they are also using our satellite data. And note that this was the first time an opportunity was being given to the private industry in the defense space sector, that is space security. 
See, the initiative to capitalize on space technology is an example of what security will mean for any strong nation in the future. Here, take the example of ISRO's workhorse, which is nothing but the PSLV. See, it had carried out more than 53 successful flights and the rocket has attained operational status. And since 1990, ISRO has been providing satellite launch services through PSLVs, which launched 345 customer satellites from 34 countries across the globe. Now, what is the significance of this for India? See, launching of satellites for global clients had earned us approximately $279 million of foreign exchange through the commercial arms. And this is exactly why we have to focus on space technology and its security. And like I said before, capitalizing on space technology is an example of what security will mean for any strong nation in the future. Now you would have understand why India is working so keenly on space sector and why Prime Minister has launched this mission. Now this is about this news article. See, in between we saw about the South Asia satellite, right? Now we'll see that also briefly. See, it is India's first ever South Asia satellite and it was launched on May 2017. The South Asia satellite or the GSAT-9, which is a geosynchronous communications and meteorology satellite is developed by Indian Space Research Organization. See, it is launched for the South Asia Association for Regional Cooperation Region, that is SARC region. And this idea was mooted by India in 18th SARC Summit. So what is it for? We saw that it is a communication and meteorology satellite, right? So it is for boosting communication and for improving disaster links among the six neighbors. Now who are those six neighbors? It is the Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives and Sri Lanka. And they are the users of the multidimensional facilities provided by the satellite. And this satellite was launched for opening up new horizons of engagement in the region. And also, the satellite helps India to carve a unique place for itself in the space diplomacy. Now you may ask a question. See, SARC member countries include 8 countries, right? So, if we leave India, there should be seven other countries. And why did I say six neighbors? It is because Pakistan is not a part of this project as it had refused to accept India's proposal. And that is exactly why the proposal to name the satellite as SARC satellite was changed to South Asia satellite. Now, having said that, what are the benefits of the launch of this satellite? See, the first benefit is that the countries would benefit in communication, telemedicine, meteorological forecasting and broadcasting. And secondly, it is to prove once again that India is the only country in South Asia that has independently launched satellites on indigenously developed launch vehicles. And thirdly, it geopolitically strengthens India's strong neighbors policy. Now that is all about this particular article discussion. In this article discussion, we saw about the important points mentioned in the article. We saw about the different space mission and the need for it. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the South Asia satellite. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have three prelims question. I'll solve two of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now let us take this first question for a discussion. Which among the following vulture species are not given the status of critically endangered in the IUCN red list? So we have to find the species which is not given the status of critically endangered. Now before answering the question, we'll see the table here. See these are the nine species that are found in India. First one is Oriental White Backed Vulture, it is critically endangered. Slender Billed Vulture and Long Billed Vulture, these two are critically endangered. Egyptian Vulture, endangered. Red Headed, critically endangered. Indian Griffon, least concerned. Himalayan Griffon, near threatened. Cinereus Vulture, near threatened. Bearded Vulture, near threatened. So what are all the four species that are declared as critically endangered? Oriental white-backed, 
slender build long build red headed now see the question again here we know that oriental slender build and long build these three are critically endangered so what is the odd one out here it is statement 2 so what is the correct answer here the correct answer is option b 2 only now moving on to the next question with reference to national education policy 2020 consider the following statements say nep 2020 makes it compulsory for the students in india to learn three languages to promote multilingualism the statement is correct see it is compulsory for students in india to learn three languages but the most important thing to note here is that hindi is not made compulsory students they have the option to choose any of the languages they prefer now coming to the second statement out of the three languages two must be native languages belonging to india and this statement is correct see we saw that statement 1 and statement 2 they both are correct so what is the correct option here correct option is option c both 1 and 2 now take this third question here this is only the quiz question for you read the question carefully think about it for a moment and post your answer in the comment section today i have displayed two mains question so interested aspirants write it and post your answer in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you like the video like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar ai's academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you